This is a good illustration of why you should try to read a book of the Bible like Matthew as a whole. The first reason is to be able to remember the whole story when you don't have a Bible in front of you. This can be helpful in emergencies. Think of the Burnhams who were held captive as missionaries for a year without a Bible. Could you do a devotion on the book of Matthew without your Bible in front of you? Or the people who are being held hostage now in Haiti? Or, less dramatic circumstances, if you're busy doing something else like putting your kids to bed, could you think of the story of Matthew and review it in the dark? The other reason is for context, to prevent taking parts of a book out of context, whether you're the one doing it or whether someone else is making an argument to you that is being taken out of context. We also have the whole Bible, the Old Testament, three other Gospels, and the rest of the New Testament to help us understand Matthew. And this is important today because Matthew 8, this section, the first half of Matthew 8, contains a frequently quoted verse about Jesus' power to heal as it relates to his atonement of our sins on the cross. And this is the verse that we need to understand in context. Matthew 8, 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. And that came from our worship text today in Isaiah 53. Let me just quickly remind you of the whole story of Matthew. We get an introduction that includes the story of Jesus' birth. We have Jesus' ministry preparation where he's uh, baptized and tempted. Then the Sermon on the Mount that we just read. Then we're in Jesus' miracle ministry. We're going to see Jesus' power over sickness, storms, demons, sin, and death. And then Jesus sends his disciples on a missions trip to exercise his power over all of those things. And then we're going to see Jesus' teaching ministry, and people recognize Jesus as the Christ. They respond to Jesus as the Christ. They reject Jesus as the Christ. Jesus talks about his judgment for what it will be like for people who reject him as the Christ. And then the conclusion of the book is Jesus dying and rising again to save us from our sins. So here we are in the story. When he came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. Down from the mountainside means after the Sermon on the Mount is over. Remember that Moses also went up a mountain, got the Ten Commandment, came down, and real life is going on. You see, miraculous healings and teachings are both reasons that such a large crowd followed Jesus. And Jesus' preaching and healing go together, like Moses' teaching and miracles went together. In fact, this section here in Matthew contains exactly 10 miracles. Do you remember how many miracles Moses did in regard to bringing plagues on Egypt? There was 10. It's probably another way that Matthew is showing us that Jesus is the new Moses. Also, these miracles, the unclean, are made clean and welcomed into Jesus' kingdom. We'll consider more what that means. People ask the question about whether these are collected miracles, just like the Sermon on the Mount might be collected sections. Jesus preached a lot of sermons on a lot of mountains, and he did a lot of miracles between that time. And it seems like uh, the miracles Matthew's going to tell us about are in a different order, in, especially in Luke. I've heard an argument recently that Mark and John are probably trying more for a chronological telling of what happened, the stories that they tell, while Matthew and Luke are doing a logical grouping. It's interesting that he told us about all of Jesus' teaching, and now he's going to tell us about all of Jesus' miracles. So here we are. The first miracle is Jesus heals a man with leprosy. A man with leprosy came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Again, you can read the parallels of this in Mark 1 and Luke 5. 
There were also other lepers that Jesus healed. You can see that in Matthew 26, Mark 14, and Luke 17. Jesus healed lots of lepers. And then Jesus even referred to leprosy in some of his other teachings. The Old Testament had leprosy laws in Leviticus 13 through 15, in Numbers 5 and Deuteronomy 24. Here's the long and short of it. Leprosy makes you unclean, so you have to stay away from other people so you won't share the disease with them. It's very contagious. And the word here is lepos, which means a scale. This probably includes all skin diseases, not just Hansen's disease, which is modern-day leprosy. Okay, and the leper comes to Jesus and he calls him Lord, which could mean sir or master or king, or it could mean the Lord God of the Old Testament based on how it's used in context. And this man knelt before Jesus, it says in the NIV, he bowed according to the ESV. In the King James Version, it says he worshiped Jesus. In the Sermon on the Mount, do you remember that Jesus told a story about people calling him Lord, Lord, meaning the king and judge of God's kingdom, which shows that Matthew, who's writing this, means that Jesus is the Lord, God of the Old Testament, even if the leper did not understand that yet. We've got this double meaning coming from the author of the book, pushing us to think about what it means fully that Jesus is Lord. And then the leper asks if Jesus is willing to heal him. We pray that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven in the Lord's prayer. And it's not Jesus' power, but his will that is in question when we pray. Whatever you ask God for, he's able to do. What we're actually asking is, will you please do this? God has the power to grant all of our requests it just isn't always his will to do so. And Jesus taught us to pray, God's will be done, and he modeled that when he prayed right before he went to the cross. I want to get out of this, but not my will, but your will be done. So Jesus says, yes, I am willing, and then Jesus touched him to heal him. And we're going to see that Jesus touches in at least six, I believe, of these ten miracles to heal. Normally, touching something unclean makes you unclean, not the other way around, right? If you find a really cool dead bird in the backyard and you bring it in and you put it on the kitchen table, did the dead bird suddenly become clean because the kitchen table was clean? Did the kitchen table suddenly become dirty because the dead bird was dirty? Yeah. That's usually the direction it goes. And uncleanness is actually a word for guilty. But instead, when Jesus touches unclean people, he makes them clean, healthy, and forgiven. See, there's a, a dual meaning referring to healing as becoming clean that we need to watch for throughout all these stories. Jesus also reaches out his hands for various purposes all through the book of Matthew. And did you notice in our worship text today in Isaiah 53 that it talks about the Messiah's ministry as revealing the arm of the Lord. Your arms are what you work with. They're powerful. And we see Jesus, when we see Jesus' arms, we see God's arm at work. And then Jesus says something interesting after he heals him. He says, don't tell anyone. You see, Jesus said this several times. He didn't want everyone to know who he was yet. The first reason not to tell was for practical reasons, so that Jesus could still move around freely. The second reason not to tell was so that they could tell the correct audience first. Jesus wanted to make sure that his own people, the Jews, and especially the Jewish leaders, heard about him first. By going through the process that Moses prescribed, the testimony would be presented directly to the priests. That's the Pharisees and Sadducees who Jesus has been talking about and talking to in these stories. And being a testimony or a witness is either to them or against them if they won't believe it. Jesus wants them to have the evidence that they can either accept or reject. 
And Jesus is also showing that he is fulfilling the law. Remember that? The beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, I'm not getting rid of the law until I fulfill all of it. And he's doing that. He's turning unclean people into clean people and sending them through the process of the law. There's also a good point that I, Jesus doesn't want to be known primarily as a miracle worker, but as a cleanser. The miracles are to show us that he can cleanse us. Jesus isn't showing off with these miracles any more than we should show off when we pray, fast, or give. Remember, that was a big point in the Sermon on the Mount. And then, do you remember Old Testament leprosy stories? Moses, one of the signs he had was to put his hand in and make it turn into leprosy. Miriam was uh, fighting with Moses and God made her temporarily have leprosy. David got mad at Joab for one of the bad things Joab did and said, may everyone in your house always have leprosy. It's kind of a mean curse to give someone. Uh, Elijah healed Naaman and then Gehazi stole the present that Elijah tried to give to Naaman and Gehazi got leprosy. And then Elisha, in his story, there was two lepers who uh, were, uh, found some stuff outside the camp because they were outside. They found out that the army had been defeated and came back and told everyone. And then good King Uzziah ended his life not being such a good king. He tried to go in and make sacrifices in the temple and he got leprosy. And Job's skin condition he got sounds like leprosy. There's lots of Old Testament stories. Basically, in most of those examples, it looks like leprosy is caused by God as a punishment for sin or a warning of judgment, and that only God can heal leprosy. And the belief that sin causes sickness and death is true in general, but should not be applied to every single sick person. We get sick and die because of sin, but it's not always our own sin that causes our sickness. But either way, whether you did sin and got sick directly as a result of your sin, or you're inheriting and other people's sin is getting to you, the good news is that Jesus became sin for us to save us from sickness and even death. The gospel is that God wills for unclean people who believe in Jesus, and they believe that Jesus has the power to cleanse them, it is God's will that they be cleansed. Even if God doesn't heal you of all your diseases in this life, he makes you clean in Jesus just for asking. Your sin is forgiven in Jesus because Jesus has the power to forgive and it's God's will that you ask him to forgive you. So the next person who comes to Jesus is a centurion. When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished. And he said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When then Jesus said to the centurion, go, it will be done for you just as you believed it would, and his servant was healed that very hour. Capernaum is Jesus' home and main base for ministry. He moved there in Matthew 4. And there's parallels in Luke 7 and probably not John 4. It's another healing of someone at a distance. Uh, some people think it's a parallel, but it might not be. 
if you struggle with the idea that Jesus did similar miracles twice, I want you to notice that Matthew tells of similar miracles of healing a paralyzed person right here back to back in Matthew 8 and 9. And then he tells the story about Jesus feeding the 4,000 and the 5,000 in Matthew 14 and 15. Just because two miracles sound the same don't mean they're necessarily the same story. Jesus performed a lot of miracles in three, three and a half years, and we don't have them all written down. Okay? So this centurion is a Roman soldier who commanded up to a century of men, up to a hundred men. And another centurion had servants and had a house that was seen as unclean in Acts 10, and Peter would not go to his house. We also have examples of other soldiers believing in Jesus in the Gospels and Acts. And then this soldier is talking about a servant. And two of the three times he uses the word boy for servant. In Matthew, uh, he also calls him a servant or a slave. In Luke, he calls him a slave all of those times. But this could either be his own son, it could be a soldier, or it could be a household servant. And this boy is paralyzed. He's lying, passively suffering. And this illness can't be accurately diagnosed from this distance of time any more than leprosy can be exactly identified. But whatever it was, he was healed at that very hour when Jesus said he would be healed. And Luke 7 tells us he confirmed this when he got home. They like checked their watches. I was talking to Jesus at 307. What time did he get well? It just he suddenly got well right exactly at 307. And then he invites him, or Jesus invites himself to go to this man's house, and he says he doesn't want Jesus to come under his roof. Jesus is willing to enter the unclean house of a Roman official, just like he was willing to touch the unclean leper. Jews did not want to do these things. And the centurion says he does not deserve or is not worthy to have Jesus come over. He's probably saying, I'm not worthy to have you make yourself unclean by coming into my house. This is the same thing that John the Baptist said about not deserving, not being fit to untie or carry Jesus' sandals. But he acknowledged Jesus' authority. Authority. Remember that at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, people were shocked at Jesus' authority to teach. And Jesus' authority is an issue throughout the book of, Ma of Matthew. And he calls Jesus Lord again, that word that means Sir, Master King, or the Lord God of the Old Testament, based on context. Again, Matthew is making us think about what does it mean that Jesus is Lord. And it's the soldier who says, all you have to do is say the word. You see, Jesus does not have to touch in order to heal, but he can and does. He's willing to get that close, but he doesn't have to get that close in order to heal. And in the, in the Bible, God's word can mean the Bible itself. It can mean Jesus, or it can mean the word of the gospel, the, the specific truth that the reason Jesus came was to take our sin and death upon himself and die and rise again. It means all those things based on context. And now Jesus says, I tell you the truth. See, Jesus' healing word proves the truth and authority of his teaching as well. And Jesus says, this guy has great faith. Do you remember in the Sermon on the Mount, he looked at his disciples and said, you guys have little faith. They still had faith, but he's impressed by the great faith he's got here. Now, Others were amazed at Jesus' miracles, just like they were amazed at Jesus' words. But this time, it's Jesus' turn to be amazed. There's only two times Jesus is described as being amazed. And the other time is nearby when he visits Nazareth. And his own people, the people he grew up with, don't believe in him. It amazed him that a centurion did believe. And it amazed him that his own family did not believe. And then... What he says the centurion is being invited to is heaven, which is God's banquet, where Gentiles, which are the nations, are welcomed. And this, there are several passages describing heaven as a banquet, and oftentimes they will mention that the Gentiles will be welcomed to this banquet, even in the Old Testament. 
And he says they will take their places at this banquet. That's literally recline at the table. This is what Jesus did with his disciples at the Last Supper. This is close, touching fellowship, crowding around the table with Jesus. And the Gentiles have actually been in on God's blessing to Abraham from the very start. You can find this throughout the Old Testament. But Matthew is written for Jews, but it constantly is looking over their shoulders to assure the Gentiles that they will be welcomed by God too. I'm actually amazed because of how often this happens. Uh, people often emphasize that Matthew is a Jewish uh, gospel, and it is. But the Gentiles always are there included. I'm writing this to Jews. Oh yeah, and you too, Gentiles. And in Matthew 10, the disciples are going to be sent on their first missions trip. And Jesus says, only go to Jews in that missions trip. But in Matthew 28, after he rises from the dead, the Great Commission sends them to all nations. And then we see that happen going out in the rest of the New Testament. Have any of you read the Go Eat Popcorn books recently? Galatians Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. That's a huge theme in those books, isn't it? That the gospel is for Gentiles and Jews. There's a Jewish prayer that people used to uh, pray in Jesus' time where they thanked God, I am not a woman, I am not a Gentile, and I'm not a slave. Since those were all unclean. And Jesus just healed an unclean leper now he heals a Gentile slave, and he's about to heal a woman. And this feast that he talked about was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's feast. See, it's God's people physically descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus warns them, just like John the Baptist did, that they might not inherit God's kingdom. And John the Baptist said, like a tree that gets cut down. And the kingdom of heaven is John the Baptist's message and Jesus' message. It's the message of the Sermon on the Mount, and they agree that you must repent to enter the kingdom of heaven, regardless of who you are, Jew or Gentile. And watch out, everyone. Gentiles can reject Jesus too. There's going to be a story of Gentiles not believing at the end of Matthew 8. See, and Jesus is not just adding more people to this feast, but excluding those who think they deserve to be there. And again, what we're seeing is the surprises about who will be in the kingdom and who will be thrown out. And again, if you haven't read The Last Battle yet by C.S. Lewis, it's worth reading how he makes us think about the surprises about who will end up in God's kingdom. And then this uh, subjects of the kingdom is literally sons of the kingdom. And Jesus talks about either being sons of the kingdom of heaven or sons of hell. And in heaven, it's the place where the tears are wiped away. But hell is the place that is dark fire. We saw darkness versus light in the Sermon on the Mount. We saw that the Gentiles are the ones who lived in darkness. Jesus is doing his miracles in a generally Gentile area. And this getting kicked out of heaven will lead to weeping and gnashing of teeth, which is always a description of hell or judgment in both the Old and New Testament. It's probably a quote from Psalm 12. So here's the good news that we see in this story. Unclean people who believe in Jesus are cleansed, they're accepted into God's family, and they are welcomed at God's feast. Which brings us to the last miracle. Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law and then goes on to heal all the sick people who are around. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her, and she got up and began to wait on him. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word, and he healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and he carried our diseases. This story has parallels in Mark 1 and Luke 4. The fact that it starts with when evening came is a reminder that this is probably the same story from Mark 1, which means he's just been at the synagogue all day. Jews counted the, the next day starting at sunset. The Sabbath is over. Everyone can move, and they all come and find Jesus. 
And Matthew skips the story of Jesus driving out a demon at the synagogue that day, which is told in Mark 1 and Luke 4. But he goes directly from this story to another story about driving out demons that we're going to hear next week. So he's going to Peter's house. Peter is the first and one of the only disciples at this time. Peter, Andrew, James, and John are the only four disciples Matthew has told us about. Matthew's going to tell us about himself joining in Matthew chapter 9. And archaeology and tradition say that Peter and Andrew's house, where they go, later became a church. We probably know where this house is. And then... This is something that as a Protestant, I always have to point out, Peter was married. If, that, if you don't understand that, that means that the person who uh, people will count as the first pope was married. It does all kinds of stuff for your idea of what it means for priests not to be allowed to marry if you admit that the first one was. Okay, sorry, that's just a side comment. Peter obeyed this command to honor his parents and even his wife's parents by caring for them. And in a later discussion of uncleanness, Jesus is going to say that failing to honor your aging parents by taking care of them not only breaks the Ten Commandments, it makes you unclean. You want to know about real uncleanness? It's not taking care of your aging parents. And being unclean, again, is, is not a topic that looks like it's in in this story, but you're not supposed to touch lepers, but you're also not supposed to touch sick women, especially on their beds, or you'll be unclean. It's right there in Leviticus 15, right by the information about lepers in Leviticus 14. It looks like Matthew is picking examples of unclean people that Jesus is willing to touch. But even in the Old Testament, don't get carried away, women inherit God's promises. They never should have taken this to mean all of what they thought it meant. Sin is connected to sickness all throughout the Old and New Testament. And Peter's mom is again, or mother-in-law, is lying there passively. She can't get up like the paralyzed servant was. And then these demon-possessed people and sick people who Jesus healed are brought passively. They're carried to Jesus. And the devil loves sickness and misery since he tricked people into death and he likes it when he can get us sick, miserable, and not moving. But Peter's mother-in-law, once she was well, used her moving to serve them. That's why the devil doesn't want us moving. When we're moving, we're serving. We're doing what God wants us to do. It shows she was instantly and completely healed that she got up and started making dinner for them, probably is what it means, that she served them. And healing is a sign of the Messiah throughout the whole Old Testament. In a fictional story by J.R.R. Tolkien, in The Return of the King, it says this about Aragorn. It says, The hands of the king are the hands of a healer, and so shall the rightful king be known. Tolkien is saying something about Jesus by that. He's writing a fictional character who is a king who can heal because Jesus is the king who can heal. Jesus healed and cast out spirits with a word. He didn't even need to lift a finger. Just like God in creation, he says it and it happens. He's also willing to touch uncleanness. Those are the two ways he healed here. But Jesus drove out spirits, which are demons, and he healed. The fact that he did both of those things shows that not all illnesses have a demonic origin. The word demon-possessed is demonized, literally in Greek, and we'll discuss Jesus' authority over the devil more next week and following where the stories come up. And these are all signs or miracles that are designed to bring faith, but they can be stumbling blocks instead that make it harder for us to believe. In Matthew 13 and Mark 6, Jesus didn't do many miracles in his hometown because not many people believed and came to him. And there's only really one time it looks like Jesus was in a large crowd of sick people that he didn't heal all the sick people present. 
And that's when he healed the paralyzed man by the water. He was talking about the other sick people who were there. Other than that, it looks like every time Jesus walked into a, a room with sick people in it, when he left, they were all healed. So this brings us back to the Bible verse that we need to understand in context. What does it mean that Jesus took our infirmities and carried our diseases? Matthew says, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and he carried our diseases. So here's the question. Is this an accurate summary of what Matthew 8 teaches about Isaiah 53? That divine healing is an integral part of the gospel and that deliverance from sickness is provided for in the atonement and is, in the, is the privilege of all believers. Meaning, if you're a Christian, you should always be able to be healed. Now, two out of the three verses given for believing that this is normal for all Christians to believe that I found are Matthew 8, quoting from Isaiah 53. The third verse that is given to defend this idea um, is the command from James to pray in faith to be healed. But we should do that. We should pray in faith for healing, but we should not take that verse from James out of context either. Did you know that two verses before telling us pray in faith to be healed mentions Job as the ultimate example of what it looks like to follow God? In other words, there are times when people are sick and it is not their fault that they are sick. And sometimes when all of their children die, that it is not their fault that all of their children died. Okay? I thought this was a good response, that there is healing in the atonement. What Jesus did for us on the cross, there is healing in that. But in this life, it is only partial healing and it's on God's terms, and when he desires, the death rate for Christians remains at 100%. Until Jesus returns, we can be sure that we will still die, even though Jesus died for us to give us new life. And that includes healing us from everything. We will be healed of everything, but not until Jesus returns. God's people got sick and even died in the Old Testament. The same is true in the New Testament. Sometimes we're told to pray, like in James 5. Other times we're told to change our diet or take a medication for our ailment, like Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy. And sometimes we even end up staying sick and even missing out on ministry opportunities, like Paul tells Timothy happened to Trophimus, who he had to leave behind on a missions trip because Paul, the miracle worker healer, didn't just heal him that time. You see, there are biblical examples where it is God's will to include physical weakness, illness, and even spiritual attack. I think what the leper says, if you are willing, is something that Matthew is telling us how to pray. So the question is, is Matthew quoting Isaiah 53 out of context and twisting it for his own purpose? Some people think this is the case because the way that Matthew quoted Isaiah 53 is actually not being quoted from the Greek version of the Bible. He either translated this on his own from Hebrew or he's trying to, to paraphrase it. But Matthew understands that Isaiah 53 in context is about Jesus, and so does the rest of the New Testament. This is a very often quoted passage about Jesus. So here's the rest of the ways that Matthew uses Isaiah 53. He always uses it to refer to Jesus' ministry of dying on the cross. Here it says that Jesus took our diseases. In Matthew 27, it says that Jesus gave no answer like a silent lamb going to the slaughter. Also in Matthew 27, Jesus was buried with the rich. In Matthew 20, it says that Jesus came to serve by giving his life as a ransom for many. Do you see that all the other times he used this, he's referring to Jesus' death as the thing that's being referred to. You see, Isaiah 53 is the purpose clause of Jesus' ministry. Jesus came to save us from sin and all of sin's consequences. Jesus came to save us from our sin. That's what his ministry was all about. 
it's even what Jesus' name means. Jesus' name is Savior because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus came to save us from sin and all its effects, including taking care of our physical needs. And yet, our greatest treasures are waiting for us in heaven. You can see both of those things right in the Sermon on the Mount. We should ask God and trust him for our physical needs, but our greatest treasures are waiting in heaven. Jesus' death is the cause of no more tears, but heaven is the time and place when we will finally have no more tears. Death was defeated by Jesus when he died and rose again, but death is still called the last enemy to be defeated by Jesus, raising us from the dead when he returns. And Jesus will heal all diseases and remove all causes of pain, even death itself, but not until he returns. We need to be careful. The kingdom of God is both already and not yet. This is called over-realized eschatology, where you end up arguing that this earth, or this heaven and earth, is all that there is. We do have good things to look forward to when Jesus gets back. My conclusion is that Jesus came to save the unclean from the effects of sin. To understand what Matthew means when he says that Jesus fulfills Isaiah 53, 4, is to remember the context of what we just read in the first half of Matthew 8. All of Matthew 8 and 9, we see miracles where uncleanness is made clean by coming into contact with Jesus. And when Matthew says this was to fulfill Isaiah 53, 4, he's referring to all the miracles that he just told us about as fulfilling that. Jesus came to fulfill the whole Old Testament law, prophets, and even Bible stories. And in the context of Matthew 8, to say that Jesus takes our infirmities, that means sickness that is also uncleanness. Here's things that can make you unclean according to the Old Testament law. Unclean food, diseases like leprosy, bodily functions, including women's issues that he's, Jesus is going to heal later on in this, and dead bodies. Numbers says it this way, The Lord said to Moses, Command the Israelites to send away from the camp anyone who has an infectious skin disease or a discharge of any kind or who is ceremonially unclean because of a dead body. And in practice, to stay clean, the Jews stayed away from the Gentiles who ate unclean food, from lepers who had an unclean illness, and from women who had unclean bodily functions, and they stayed away from dead bodies. Also, the evil spirits that Jesus cast out are literally unclean spirits. In Matthew 8 through 9, Jesus touches, eats with, heals, and cleanses people who are unclean in all of those categories. Gentiles, sick, women in bed, demon-possessed people, sinners, and even the dead. You know how to really stay clean in the Old Testament? In the middle of all these purity laws comes Leviticus 19, which reviews the Ten Commandments and says to love your neighbor as yourself. Even in the Old Testament, right in the middle of Leviticus, Leviticus 19 is a reminder that ceremonial uncleanness was to show that sin in our hearts is actually what makes us unclean. And the punishment for sin is usually death. And the solution for sin in Leviticus is an atonement or a cleansing from sin. In Leviticus 16, it says, on this day, the day of atonement, atonement will be made for you to cleanse you. Then, before the Lord, you will be clean from all your sins. Normally, when something dirty touches something clean, the clean thing gets dirty. It's only when God does the miracle of the atonement, where God himself provides a sacrifice that can cleanse us, that a clean thing can make a dirty thing like our hearts clean. When Jesus touched the leper, the leper became clean. When Jesus spoke the word, the centurion's servant was healed. But Jesus was willing to visit his house, knowing that if he had entered it, it would have made the whole house clean. Clean. 
When Jesus touched Peter's mother-in-law in bed, she was healed and cleansed. And when Jesus drives away unclean spirits, the formerly demon-possessed person is healed and cleansed. Jesus is God, and he is therefore perfect, holy, clean. But he's willing to come. He came to the unclean earth. Jesus lived a perfectly holy and clean life in our place, and he died the death that we deserve in order to save us from our sin. He rose from the dead to conquer death and sin and to give us his cleanness and holiness. And now Jesus is back in heaven to apply his atonement to all of us who ask to be cleansed from our sin. And when Jesus returns, he will rescue us from the unclean state of death and take away all of our unclean diseases and give us a holy and clean life and invite us to come sit down at his table right next to him and eat with him forever. And right now, in advance, if you're willing to confess that you are unclean, and that you need Jesus to cleanse you, then you are already invited to come right to Jesus' table, to crowd in there with him so that your knees touch his under the table. He'll get that close to you because he's confident that he will make you clean.